Are living planets possible? Let's look at the bigger picture here. Science behind Ego the Living Planet. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is finally here, and with it we're getting a whole new slew of awesome looking Marvel characters. Seriously, look at these designs. They're awesome. Along with all that, however, we also get to meet the character Ego the Living Planet. Needless to say, Ego is a living planet. But are living planets even possible? Well, there's a lot of factors that play into such an idea. Heck, even life on a small scale is pretty complicated. That segues us into our next point. While what makes something alive is debatable, we know what things are alive and what aren't on our own planet, for the most part anyway. Most of us probably grew up looking at animals and people as living things on Earth. But by a certain point, we're also taught that plants are alive too. The separation comes from the fact that animals and people have visual communication, free movement, and some level of obvious intelligence. At least on surface glances, plants don't have any of these. But make no mistake, they are living organisms. So why am I bringing this up? Well, a living plant would probably work in a very similar fashion to how plants work. It wouldn't be an animal, and certainly not a highly intelligent species like humans, because it's so big that its primary focus would have to be on just basic survival. To understand how a living planet might work, we need to understand how plants work. Most plants, i.e. green plants, collect nutrients to survive from the environment around them. More specifically, there are two main methods. One is a process in which roots of the plant seep up water and other essentials from the earth and transport them to the plant. Then, of course, there's the famous process of photosynthesis. 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 Photosynthesis is the process in which chlorophyll, a chemical pigment that makes a green plant green, absorbs sunlight and converts it into energy, which allows it to make its own sugars out of carbon dioxide, air, and water. This is why carbon dioxide is actually good for a lot of plants, and why I was told when I was younger that breathing out helps plants. You're breathing out carbon dioxide for them. Now that we know how plants survive biologically, it isn't difficult to picture a planet as one giant plant floating in space. Being a planet, it could be said that the environment on it already provides it with resources, like water, to seep from the surface to the core, perhaps using root-like extensions. It also isn't hard to imagine that, since sun rays travel through space to the surrounding celestial bodies, that sunlight wouldn't be a problem for such a planet. In fact, some even argue this is how plants work. It's called the Gaia Theory, and while it hasn't gained a whole lot of traction, it's definitely an interesting way to look at celestial bodies on a biological level. Living planets are looking pretty possible. Only they might not be. The issue with this, since we're looking at biological life for how a planet could be alive, is that an organism simply wouldn't ever need to be that big. Aside from the fact that life starting in the void of space is likely extremely difficult, we also run into an issue with the theory of evolution. Evolution, at least the idea behind it, shows that species evolve to adapt to their environments and to better survive. While a living planet would definitely be the dominant species in a galactic ecosystem, it wouldn't need to evolve to be that way. Planetary environments can already have top predators and species, some of which haven't evolved in millions of years. Heck, look at alligators and sharks. They're the perfect killing machines, and they have been for so long, they just haven't needed to adapt. A species going beyond such a point just doesn't play out in how the theory of evolution works. Much simpler, it's perhaps best said by Peter Ward, a professor of paleontology at the University of Washington. The way evolution works, I can't see it happening. So, while living planets are theoretically possible, they seem extremely unlikely. It shouldn't be written off that a plant-like organism could grow to the size of a planet and serve the same purpose as one, but the issue is, it probably won't because it just would never need to. We live in a huge, huge universe. In a lot of ways, we have it easy. We live in these environments that give us both advantages and disadvantages, at least in the natural world. Out in space, a species trying to survive in a void has only a ton of odds stacked against it. That kind of species just wouldn't need, or really probably want, to end up trying to evolve in that sort of environment. Again, compared to that theoretical species, we have it easy. Maybe we should deflate our egos. Hey guys, hope you all enjoyed the episode of Science Behind Superheroes. This was like a way simpler one to do, I feel, because it's, it's pretty quick, honestly. It is a quick video. Um, and I think it's because it honestly is kind of a, a simple concept without getting into 
Um, not needless specifics, but it's definitely something that you can understand very easily without needing to know everything about it. Uh, you know, you can explain uh, solid photosynthesis and all that, but uh, you just kind of need to do the more basic stuff like photosynthesis in order to understand how this all works uh, without needing to go down to it on a cellular level. So uh, I'm sorry if it's kind of short, but that's kind of how it is really with this topic. Uh, I do think it was very interesting, though, especially the Gaia theory. I think that that's a very interesting idea, and I think that I'll study that more in the future because I'm actually very intrigued by that. So yeah, guys, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is coming out pretty soon for some of you. For some of you, it may even have already come out. Um, so, I mean, watch the comments for spoilers. Uh, I'll hopefully be seeing the movie soon, and by then I'll have a review for it and all that. So stay tuned for that, guys, and stay tuned for the next episode of Science Behind Superheroes. If you guys like this episode, make sure to like and make sure to leave a comment as to what superhero or supervillain you guys want to see me do next. And I will see you guys next week.